Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode eight of that real estate podcast with Henry Matthews. Today, I'm sitting down with Brian Karski. Before we get started with that, though, I want to thank everyone who's taken the time to subscribe, um, everyone who's uh, followed us on Instagram. Um, I think we're well over 600 followers now, and I know I've touched on it on a couple videos before, but um, I don't know what is great growth on Instagram, but for me, um, you know, 600 plus followers in less than a month is pretty awesome. And I'm very flattered and humbled by everybody who's taken the time to kind of reach out and do that. Um, if you like these videos, please go ahead and subscribe on YouTube. If you have any questions or people that you'd like me to kind of interview or questions you want me to tackle, uh, please go ahead and, uh, you know, reach out. You can uh, reach me on Instagram um, by a direct message, or you can uh, comment in the YouTube videos um, as you're watching them. But that being said, um, Brian, how are you? I'm good, buddy. How are you doing today? I'm doing really, really well. So I asked Brian to come on the show to explain something really interesting that he's done. He purchased an investment property and got 100% of his money back, effectively making the house free. Free. I love it. Free. Yeah. And I wanted him to come on and explain to you guys how he did that. And he was kind enough to take time out of his day to uh, come on and do that. So, uh, Brian, I'm going to ask you first to just kind of introduce yourself and then we'll kind of get started on how you pulled this thing off. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Brian Karshi. I am a uh, real estate represent sales representative with uh, Keller Williams Complete in Hamilton. Uh, I've been in real estate now uh, about six and a half years and I've been actively investing in about uh, for about three years. Uh, we got into it because I got to the realization in real estate when I uh, left the corporate um, construction engineering world that there is no pension in real estate. Um, there is no long-term goal as a, other than just means that you work for your commission um, and that's it. There's no real way of passive income or uh, pension for stuff like that. Um, so we got into real estate uh, investing. Uh, Henry, one of your, your past uh, attendees on the show, Alex Powell, I was uh, working with him on a real estate team. Um, I was meaning to get into investing and I did the typical um, analysis paralysis of every single project was, uh, you know, this house costs too much, the renovations are going to cost too much, I can't make the closing work, things like that. Um, and I just hummed and hawed over every single property. And a property came up and uh, I, I passed on it because I thought that it's going to go for way too much. It went into a bidding war. And Alex Powell turned to me and he said, you know, if I, if I had the money right now, I'd jump on this. It's an absolute slam, you know, I, uh, you know, grand slam of a deal. I'll, uh, I would take it if I could. And, you know, the ultimate sales pitch, right? You know, if you don't buy it, I would. And uh, we ended up buying it. It was our first Burr project. Um, shit hit the fan a little bit on it. We left a little bit of money in, but then we that was a duplex. We jumped into our first triplex and then another triplex and another one. And uh, we've been doing it ever since. So since that first kind of screw up, every property that we do now, we get 100% of our money back plus, uh, plus a small surplus or a profit. And we essentially own these properties for free. Um, so yeah, so that's why we, uh, we got into it. And that's kind of my journey ever since then. So we're at about 22 I guess 22 doors or 22 units uh, right now in about three years. And, um, and yeah, that's, uh, that's what we're doing right now. Awesome. So this particular property, let's start from the beginning. How did you yeah. find it? Um, uh, where did you go? Yeah. So the majority of our properties are typically we find them off market and we do this through the relationships that we have with other clients uh, from door knocking, cold calling, um, uh, relationships that we have with people in certain neighborhoods. They'll let us know when things come up. Uh, but this property was actually listed on the market before, um, which is odd because it, it was sitting for a little bit um, and I guess no one was jumping on it. And I guess that's kind of the nice thing when you find uh, the shittiest house in the not so, not necessarily the worst neighborhood, um, but let's call it an up and coming neighborhood. 
So it was on the market. It was uh, extremely dated, completely original, uh, knob and tube everywhere, asbestos galore. And, um, and yeah, yeah, it was on the market and uh, we offered on it. It went back and forth a couple of days because um, obviously you don't want to be paying uh, too much, right? The numbers have to work. And uh, yeah, we snagged it while it was, uh, was, it was on MLS. Okay. So you buy the house, right? Um, yep. How much did you pay for the house? Uh, I've got my spreadsheet open here. We paid three seven five for it, so three hundred seventy five thousand dollars. Okay. Would you say that that was below market value, or? I would say it was at market value for where the market was. We purchased this property. Um, a lot of these properties we turn over in about six to seven months. This property took us twelve months, thanks to the kick in the throat that was COVID. Um, so we bought this property. We closed on it October 31st, 2019. Okay. So you did that. How much did you spend on renovations for the property? Renovations, our grand total here, uh, apologies for the phone. Um, grand total here, we are at $223,000, give or take a couple of dollars, uh, but basically 223,000. Okay. So, and what did, what did you guys end up renovating? Oh, oh God, what do we not renovate? Um, this is everything from tearing out the old walls, putting up um, new, uh, excuse me, new, uh, new studs, uh, new electrical, new plumbing, new HVAC, uh, interior waterproofing, new doors, new windows, spray foam insulation, uh, new flooring, new staircases. Um, exterior uh, soffits, um, eaves, troughs, railings, uh, landscaping in the back, like everything. It's essentially a new house in an old shell. Okay. Um, so you've, you do all this, you've got all this worked out. So explain to the viewers here how you were able to then pull your money out um, of that property yeah, and, so and effectively make it free. Yeah, so free in the sense of when you don't have any money in something um, and you own it, it's it's essentially free, right? Now we do obviously still have a mortgage on it. The mortgage is not paid off, um, but we'll get to that in a second. So our strategy is the Burr method, um, Henry. So that's the the buy, the renovate, uh, refinance, and then you rent it out. So it's essentially, um, as some investors call it, like flipping it back to yourself. Um, cause when you go to refinance it, you're getting a new mortgage on the property, um, but you're keeping it right. So we bought it and then we completely gutted it. We turned it into a triplex. So three, uh, three units, we had to go through the city for minor variances to, uh, to have it, uh, converted to a multifamily home. Um, so once we renovate it, the home, you've taken it from one crappy value and you've forced equity into the property through renovations. Now this property that was worth something small is now worth something larger. So it's worth more. And if we were to rent it out, your cash flow would be a crazy amount because your mortgage is set to this small to this uh, small house, right? But we but we would have our down payment, our deposit, and our renovation costs on the property. So it's a, it's a good amount of money left into it and I want it back. Um, so the house is now worth up here. When you take your mortgage out and you refinance it, they give you a new mortgage at this higher amount. And when they do that, the difference right here kind of works out, I guess. That difference right there is the payout of all of your money now we are, instead of paying a mortgage on 375, we're now paying a mortgage on, uh, what are we at, about $750,000. So our tenants pay the new mortgage of $750,000 plus their own utilities, plus property management costs, plus um, property taxes, everything like that. So as even though we're paying a higher mortgage higher utilities, everything like that. The tenants pay for all that. They pay for absolutely everything. And we make about $650 a month on top of that. And um, when the 
refinance amount comes in so much higher than what you expected or an excess of what you put into the property, um, we get, managed to get back 100% of our money plus a surplus of about twenty-eight dollars to $29,000, which is, um, even though it is borrowed money from the mortgage, it's a surplus to us because it's more than what we've put in and we can take it as a profit, roll it into another property. Um, and like I said, on that new mortgage, everything's covered from the, uh, from the tenants. So we essentially own this property uh, for a mortgage of $830,000, um, but uh, the property carries itself and uh, we make money on it, even though we have nothing into it. That's beautiful. Uh, making money every month. Um, exactly. I make money while I sleep. <laughs> exactly. Um, so you said that you took a single family home and you converted it into a multifamily home. Correct. Yep. Right. Um, and you did that all legally and everything was taken care of properly. Um, can you explain to the people what that step was like? Yeah. So I was, I'm extremely grateful for the contacts that make up my, um, investing team from my lawyers, my mortgage broker, um, architect trades, con contractors, they all invest, they all get what we're doing. So it makes the process that much smoother and extremely grateful for our architect, Ken Beckendam, that, uh, takes care of the whole process with the city for us. So Ken goes in either prior to closing or right at closing. He does all the existing drawings of the house. So uh, site plan, um, floor plans, absolutely everything, elevations and everything. And he submits that to the city with proposals of what we wanna do. From there, it goes into minor variances for converting a single family detached dwelling into a multifamily home. Um, so that could be parking, that could be square footage wise that we need to apply for minor variants that let's say we don't meet the requirements. So Ken's job is to go through, comply with everything, make sure our proposed drawings are to code. And uh, he goes through that process of going into the, to the city meetings um, to make sure we comply with all that. So if there's any revisions that for amendments that need to happen to our drawings. Ken takes care of all that, resubmits, and, uh, and we get everything back. So minor variance is about uh, six to eight weeks. And then once we do the minor variances and they give us the go ahead on that, then we apply for our building permit. Uh, once we get that back, um, it's probably all in about like 12 weeks maybe to, to do all that. Um, now you can go through and do renovations without permits. Uh, we did it on our first project and um, nothing, nothing wrong with it. Like you're not, it's not like you're doing anything unsafe. Um, but when you're doing projects to this magnitude of, you know, you're essentially gutting a whole house, you don't want the city wondering what it is that you're doing and you don't want to have to be, um, you know, sneaking around and stuff. So um, working with the city, having the inspectors check things out, um, plus down the road for resale wise, uh, a duplex or a triplex is worth a lot more than a single family home with a bunch of units crammed into it. And we at least know that everything's done to code um, safely as well. There's a lot there to, that I want to kind of decompartmentalize. I'm, so, I'm sorry if I kind of go off on a tangent there. That's okay. That's okay. Um, when, you're, when you're going back and you're looking at it, so people that um, don't necessarily have an understanding of, of this process. Like maybe they have a, they, they're going to buy a single family home. They want to convert it. Um, and understanding that every municipality is different and what those rules are, right? Yep. Um, what constitutes in a general sense, the requirements for converting a single family home to a multifamily home? Yeah. So you need to have at least, um, oh, it's, it's tough because I mean, Ideally, you need to have at least one parking spot per unit. Each unit has to have its own entrance um, like that. The, any sort of common areas where people are going to be commingling, uh, they need to be fireproof, they need to be soundproofed. Um, so when it comes to fireproofing, especially in between floors, you need to have, I think it's two layers of five eighths drywall with a small channeled space in between. So that if, let's say, 
uh, God forbid one unit was to catch fire, there's about a two hour burn time between units. Um, basement heights need to be, I believe it's 75% need to be at least 6'1 or 6'2, um, things like that. Now, the Ontario building code requirements for in between units and things like that, you know, fire rated doors and windows and stuff like that, um, that's standard across the board. But when it comes to converting a home, um, it's tough to say because the other triplex that we're working on just a couple doors down from this only has two parking spots, but three units. And another triplex that we're working on as well is gonna have one parking spot, hopefully two, but we can get multifamily designation because we've gone through with minor variances where we don't meet the requirements of, let's say the site doesn't meet the site requirements for multifamily, but we are going to apply to the city and say, we're gonna be doing all these things to make a safe, reliable, home for our tenants we need a bit of a pass on parking let's say or we need a bit of a pass on we don't have a certain percentage of green space on the property if everything else is okay are you guys okay with allowing this because it's going to bring such great people to this you know let's say troubled neighborhood let's say um and the city usually works in compliance with us um because they know what we're doing is uh, is doing great things for the neighborhood so uh so they're happy to kind of uh, approve those minor variances in favor for us most of the times. Absolutely. Um, so you're a real estate professional and I, it goes without saying that a property that is a legal multi-dwelling is definitely worth a lot more than one that technically is not. For sure. Um, how much do you think this particular property, if it was not designated legal, how much do you think that would actually affect the overall value of the property? I think you could, I don't know if I could put an actual dollar amount on it. It's more of the, the peace of mind that people get, like the amount of hoops that we have to jump through with the city when we know they're coming for an inspection, you know, down to, you know, how, you know, the spacing between, you know, you know, uh, wall studs and things like that. Like it's, they're so keen on certain things that when you buy something done with permits, done with legal designation, you're buying the peace of mind that comes with like, we didn't half-ass anything because um, we've got the budget uh, cost to show that. Um, whereas, you know, like we don't have to do spray foam, but it's like the city wants to see it. And although it costs an arm and a leg, we need to do it. You know, like you're essentially redoing drywall twice with five eighths to make it fireproof. It's like, do we need to do that without permits? No but you sleep better at night knowing that you're providing safe, reliable housing and the people that buy the house after us, um, if we ever sell it, um, but the people that buy the house after us, they have that peace of mind knowing that it was done properly, done to code. The city knows about it and you're buying that peace of mind that uh, you're not going to get any knocks on the door from the city saying, you know, WTF is going on here with, uh, with this illegal dwelling. Yeah, um, before we kind of move on to the next part, um, can you speak about um, sort of what your understanding is of like the fire code and stuff for yeah. converting a single family to to a multi-dwelling? Yeah, so in, like I mentioned before, in between the units needs to have the uh, the two layers of fire, five eighths drywall uh, with the space in between for added burn time. Any sort of doors in between the units need to be fire rated storm doors. Um, that storm doors being the like those thick steel doors in between units. So that, I think there's about a two hour, an hour and a half or two hour burn time. Um, let's say you have the staircase going to the second floor is also shares the same wall with, let's say the bathroom on the main floor that needs to be fire rated as well so that each unit is, is completely self-contained uh, within that. Um, you do need to have obviously fire uh, smoke alarms in each unit. So we do the smoke alarm and CO2 detectors in each unit, they must be wired in. Uh, we do the ones that have the strobe light in case there's anyone that, uh, um, that's, um, that's deaf or something, let's say. Um, other than that, we haven't had to deal with like a sprinkler system. We do have an apartment building on the go as well, um, but we haven't had to deal too much with sprinklers and stuff. It's more of just the common 
uh, fire rated uh, type things like that for duplexes, triplexes, things like that. So for this property, um, how long did it take you to find the right tenants? Was that sort of an arduous process or? This one here, uh, it probably took us about a month and a half to two months to find our tenants for. Um, so we use a property management company called Executive Properties, um, where they actually go through the process of finding the tenants. And then we also have them as our property management company to manage the tenants. So I find that uh, when your property manager is managing those people, they don't want to manage crappy people. So they find awesome people. They're, they're um, you know, put through the rigors, the tenants, when it comes to reference checks and things like that. Um, lots of screening goes into it to find, you know, the young professionals that we typically end up, you know, gearing our places towards. Um, but yeah, it was about a month and a half, almost two months. So chronologically here, so we have gone through, you've bought the house, you have done the renovations, um, you've refinanced the property, if I'm on the right timeline here yep. uh, already. Um, was that it? Like everything came out with one refinancing or did it require multiple? Um, no, it just required the one. So um, the, the appraiser that we had come out, um, you know, saw saw what we did saw what we've done in the past um based on the comparables of the area of you know that goes without saying too when it comes to refinance the, the mortgage lenders want to see that you know they want the peace of mind that's been done properly if they're going to be lending you more money for the property so having that legal, legal designation as well um yeah they see the value in it they know what the comparables are for that area in and around the city and um and yeah, yeah, no, no issue. Pretty straightforward. So um, I want to speak to um, a lot of people are sort of mystified, obviously, by mortgages. And, and there is a lot of sort of like a lack of education around some of these topics, sort of for for most people. Um, when you're picking a mortgage um, with a lender, could you kind of speak to the importance of making sure that um, you're getting the right mortgage if refinancing is something that you want to do um, because people can face a lot of penalties, um, you know, if, if they're kind of paired with the wrong mortgage, right? I know yep. we're often, uh, it's a race to the bottom as far as the rate, but uh, yeah. sometimes finding the right mortgage is more important in the end. Um, what was that process like for you? Um, I think when you mentioned like finding the right mortgage it kind of goes with the same like it's like finding the, the right people that go on our investing team so everyone that we refer our our vendors and stuff there they all invest as well so our mortgage broker um invest as well so they know what it is that we're looking for they know what our goal is so using a broker as opposed to someone at the bank whereas you know instead of getting the product from one bank you're getting the products from multiple banks and private lenders as well so our mortgage broker uh, since they know what we're doing, they pair us with, it might not be the lowest rate, but it is a rate that is uh, typically variable because we want to have that flexibility of if we need to sell the property in a couple of years, if we want to refinance it to pull more money out in five years or less than five years, we have that ability to do that. So I think having a broker that understands what your goals are um, like if you go to refinance your current house because you want to pull equity out into a home equity line of credit, let's say, so you can start investing, you want to make sure that you're doing this, at, let's say, a variable um, as opposed to a fixed rate because you can avoid these penalties of breaking a mortgage um, and, uh, and those types of penalties like that. Absolutely. Um, so you have this property. What's your plan for it for the future? Are you planning on holding on to it? Long it term, a, or? it is a piggy bank. That's all it is. That's all it is. Eh? <laughs> um, any any of these properties, Henry. All we want to do is just as much as we make money every month on any of our properties, we've actually never even touched any of the profit that these make. So this property here, uh, with our mortgage rate, we're going to be making about five hundred and seventy-five dollars a month, um, give or take some months with you know, let's say you know, property taxes or whatever, but. Uh, roughly about $575 a month that will go into a reserve fund so that, you know, 
a window breaks, you know, we get a windstorm, a couple of shingles get lifted or something that goes into a, a reserve fund um, of, let's say, you know, it builds up to $5,000. Once we're at that amount, we can start pulling a profit and doing things like that. But I mean, you know, I'm only, I, I just turned 33 a couple of weeks, uh, was last week. Our goal for this is just to hold on to it long term. Um, so that, you know, when we're in our, you know, forties or fifties, you know, you refinance it once it can, it can pay for your, you know, kid's education, a trip, stupid car, um, whatever. Right. So yeah, definitely keep them long-term. That's for sure. So you mentioned Alex at the beginning of the video. Um, and for those that don't know, Alex was our guest in the last two episodes. Um, and he goes into detail about a number of different topics. Um, he works heavily with with partnerships with other investors as well. Yep. Um, I understand that you do the same. Um, how are you finding these investors? Um, kind of just through stuff like this, whether it's like, you know, podcast or a lot of Facebook Live. Uh, people seem to like my cheesy Facebook Live videos and reach out. Um, but I think just keeping staying active on social media where you can kind of relate to people that it really isn't that hard to do that, do this, do these kinds of things with. Um, I've gotten JV partners from, uh, the gym I used to go to through, um, you know, relationships with my wife, um, stuff like that. Like they, they kind of come from anywhere in all places, really. So if somebody wanted to be an investor and partner with you and they have no experience prior, what is sort of the bare minimum threshold for somebody that you would be looking to partnership or partner with? A lot of these properties, like Henry, like if you bought, this property that we just did, you know, a converted triplex, it's turnkey, it's ready to go, it comes with tenants. Um, if you bought it for, let's say, $750,000, as an investment property, you've got to put up 20%, right? Um, that's, a, that's a shit ton of money for a property just to hold your money in. And it's going to take a long time to get that money paid back. Whereas, you know, I'm not sitting on, you know, a gazillion dollars here. So, I put my money into these properties. It's a bit more stressful getting it to the finish line, but I get it back right away. So it's a lot more money up front, but within six to seven months or 12 months with COVID, um, you get it back right away. So the minimum threshold when it comes to stuff like this with a, with a, with a joint venture partner, I'd probably say anywhere between 150 to $200,000 when it comes to properties of this magnitude. Um, we structure those, each property is a bit different, but it comes down to, let's say they have the money and that's it. They don't have the knowledge. They don't have the time. Whereas we necessarily don't have the money to be doing multiple ones of these with our own money, but we have the team, we have the knowledge, we have the manpower to do so. And we have the time to facilitate the whole thing from start to finish that's kind of our big value proposition to them is that we partner with them on it. We get hundred percent of our money back within six to seven months, they get paid back first and we own a property 50, 50, um, afterwards. And we kind of get their foot in the door with investing. They can be as involved or, um, disconnected from the process as much as they want, but they see it as a venue to, uh, get into the whole process. We keep them informed weekly on everything. And uh, they just see it from start to finish with us. Awesome. Um, I won't take up too much of your time. And I really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, this yeah, no has worries. been really, really interesting here. Um, for anybody watching, what's your advice to somebody that might be going through that analysis paralysis that you said you had when you started? Um, what what would you say to them to try and motivate them to, to make those, you know, first steps? Yeah. So analysis paralysis comes down to do the numbers work. Am I going to make money? Um, is the house priced properly? Things like that. And this was actually a realization that one of my partners, Alex Palaszczuk said to me was if every property you look at needs to be positive cash flowing, putting money in your pocket every month, fantastic. But what is a property that you've purchased? Sorry, you would never purchase a property that costs you money every month, right? Of course. But when you look at your principal home, 
your principal home is a liability. It's not putting money in your pocket. It's an asset. It's not your asset. It's the bank's asset. So if you own a property, you're, let's say, Henry, you live at 123 Main Street. It's costing you money every month with utilities, property taxes. And if you bought that house knowing that it's costing you money every month and you're actually taking a loss on it every single month, well, that's kind of the worst investment you could have made. So anything that you buy for an investment, even if you're making 50 bucks, even five bucks a month, it's a better investment than your personal home. Now your personal home appreciates um, with value and things like that, but so does a $5 cash flowing a month investment property, right? You've got cash flow every month, you've got mortgage pay down, and you've got appreciation. One property gets you three, here we go, three lines of income from just that. So when you look at the power of, if you have a property like your principal house that actually costs you money every month in expenses, if you refinanced it in five years, you would make money. So if a house that's costing you money still appreciates over time, imagine having a property that made you $5 a month and didn't cost you anything every month. If it made you money over the next five, 10 years, and you had multiple of these, then it's, it's, it's a no brainer. Why wouldn't you get into it? Right. I agree. hundred so, percent. Um, yeah. if somebody wanted to partner with you, if somebody wanted to reach you, if somebody has questions for you, how can they best get, uh, get in touch with you? Yeah. So, uh, if you want to, uh, we can either, you know, post the contact information to my Facebook page or my email and stuff below, uh, cell phone number two, you know, text call, whatever. Um, yeah, I, I, I've got all my information out there for my, uh, contact information stuff. So yeah, if anybody ever wanted to join venture or, uh, have any questions about what it is that we do or want to see the numbers more, uh, broken down, happy to help out wherever I can.